Well, if as Science 2.0 is how the Internet and Web 2.0 is changing research, collaboration and scholarly publishing, this is now the hands-on session. We are going down to the grassroots level. Grassroots level sometimes is connotated in a negative way, but please think of the fact that without grass, without soil, there will be no trees where we can sit on and look into the future. So we need these experiences. We need to know where the users are, what they need, and where the limits are on their side and on our side. You know that this conference is organized by GoPortis, by GoPortis, and by the Leibniz Research Alliance 2.0. GoPortis is founded in 2003, is the Leibniz Library Network for Research Information, consisting of three partners, the German National Library of Economics, Leibniz Information Center for Economics, the Technic Information Library in Hanover, Leibniz Information Center for Science and uh, Technology, and our library in Cologne and Bonn, the German National Library of Medicine, the Leibniz Information Center for the Life Sciences. GoPortis is a strategic network where solutions are developed to current and future challenges in supplying information for science and practice. We are working closely together in the field of licensing, licensing for the Leibniz Association and more than that, in the field of digital preservation and in the field of document supply and also in the field of Science 2.0. We will have five speakers and if you look here at the podium, you see that we're changing the scope of the conference a little bit. There will be five talks for about only six to eight minutes, lightning talks, and the people will be in the, not on the podium but be uh, down to see what the other uh, colleagues are presenting. And then after that, you will have the possibility to uh, put your questions for five minutes each. So six or eight minutes, lightning talk, then five minutes discussion, and then the next one. And at the, at the end, we will have about, I think, half an hour for general discussion on the podium and with you. So please put down all the questions. And um, you have time for the questions, for specific questions after the after each talk, and at the end for general questions. Yes, we are starting with Mr. Hendrik Bunke. We are starting with the three GoPortis libraries, and after that with uh, the partner from the State and University Library in Dresden, and after that with our colleague from uh, Groningen in the Netherlands. So, Mr. Bunke will be the first one. He has a PhD in political sciences and has done some research and teaching in the fields of digital media and education and is now working with the German National Library of Economics, the Leibniz Information Center for Economics. And he's doing all the programming work with uh, the project he's now presenting and other projects like Edavax. He's also very active in, the, in a Web 2.0 instruments, so he's the right person to tell about the Journal Economics and Open Access, Open Assessment e-Journal. Mr. Bunker, please. I would like to introduce uh, the project, the rather old project, Economics e-Journal, the Open Access, Open Assessment e-Journal. Um, rather old since we are live since 2007, which is half an eternity, eternity in uh, speaking in Internet matters. And... Uh, I would like to talk about not so the whole journal and, and workflows and so on, but mainly I would like to emphasize on uh, aspects that could be considered to be uh, small steps or small bridges towards an open science uh, future. Um, the Air Journal is in cooperation between uh, the Kiel Institute for the World Economics and located in Kiel, as the name is, and uh, my library, I'm working for the uh, ZBW, German National Library for Economics. Um, we have, just to name, just to name the numbers, uh, 150 co-editors worldwide. It's also a very uh, backed-up journal. Um, we have an advisory board with, I think, seven Nobel Prize winners by now. Um, so it's a quite well-known uh, journal uh, at the moment and 
really good backed, backed up in the community, and which is also seen, can also be seen uh, with the fact that we are list listed in the uh, obscure social sciences citation index, uh, which means we have an impact factor. Impact factor is somebody nobody, nobody likes, uh, but anyone would, uh, everyone uh, would want to get into it uh, and want it. So if you take a look at uh, our URL, economics eJournal.org, you are welcome with this picture, just, just to give you an impression. Looks awesome, doesn't it? <laughs> and uh, I would, since we only have six minutes for each uh, talk and eight minutes uh, or before I go too much into detail, come to the three points I've mentioned, uh, which can be seen at those small steps towards open science. Uh, namely, these are open assessment, uh, I come in a, in a minute what this, what this means. Um, open data, data sets, research data is uh, also published, and our social media activities. First point, open assessment. This is the one we, we've done from the, from the start on, since 2007, which uh, basically means that the classic peer review model, which we are clearly rooted in, uh, is supplemented with a so-called open assessment. You can also say open peer reviewing. Uh, it means, in general, that all readers, readers must be registered, so they, they must prove somehow that they're economists and uh, within the field of economics uh, can comment on any paper published. Um, also, the referee reports are published usually, and most, last but not least, most important, as I think, uh, reader comments do have an influence of the decision of the co-editors if a paper is published as journal article or not. This is just a, a comment section of one of the articles. You can see there are some referee reports, even some anonymous um, comments. There are many readers who don't like to be named on the site uh, with their comments, and they can also publish their comments as anonymous. Um, and there are even some discussion. In this case, uh, an anonymous reader uh, says this is just a polemic article and adds not much value. Um, so there, there are real discussions, not only referee reports, but, but uh, real constructive or sometimes even destructive, if you like to say so, uh, comments. But mainly this, is, this works pretty well and is broadly accepted. Second point uh, is open research data. We have an open, access, uh, open data availability policy since the beginning of 2009, five years from now. Since, and uh, generally this means that all authors must provide research data as well as programs, code, and sufficient explanations uh, to permit data replication. Um, the data sets are stored at uh, Harvard Dataverse Network, which is mainly focused on social sciences uh, as, as economics. Um, it's also a quite well-known software. You can install it on your, on your own institution and uh, provide data sets. Uh, here you can see, just to give you an impression, uh, in the article, the link to the data set is simply named, and you come to this page at Dataverse, uh, where you can see, in this case, Excel, Excel files. You can download and even analyze. The third point uh, we are pretty active right by now is uh, social media activities. Um, we have several accounts. Um, there are some missing. Okay, <laughs> I just named them later. Um, as you can see, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus. We are also in linked, uh, LinkedIn by now. LinkedIn is quite quite interesting to start from from uh, the rear. Um, since there seem to be, at least at, in the US and in the UK, uh, the professional economists uh, more than are, for example, in Twitter or Google+. Uh, Twitter activities are uh, since 2009, and we are mainly tweeting automatic, uh, automatically there. So when any time an article is published, um, the system sends an automatic tweet uh, to Twitter and uh, informs the reader about the author, the link, and the title. That's basically, but uh, no one... We have so much time. It's all on a question of, of uh, men and women, power, resources to, uh, to deal with that. Facebook is uh, 
the, the numbers are better. Um, and Facebook, the editorial office also uh, writes some teasers to the links. We are, we are only publishing at Twitter. Um, so giving a context or giving a short introduction to the, uh, to the issue and so on. Um, and the same is with Google Plus since 2011. Um, there are also some, some teasers posted. And uh, surprisingly, at least for me, Google Plus is the platform, the social, social media platform, which has the most followers, or circles in this case. Um, My, my theory for this is that Google Plus really is, and someone mentioned it this morning in his talk, uh, Google Plus seems to be a more a serious platform. We have many, if you look at, at the users, we don't do this systematically or as a, stu or as, as a study at Twitter or Facebook, there seem to be many non non-economics, non-economics uh, uh, or researchers, but students or people just mainly interested in, in, in the field of economics or want to have an... Oh, sorry. Oops. Okay, Google Plus as a more serious platform. Perhaps we can uh, talk on that later. Um, for all platforms, uh, you can say that the number of followers is uh, growing steadily, but even slowly. Um, we, can, we can overcome this. I have only one minute left. <laughs> I was signaled. Um, just have a look at the number of comments. This just uh, puts an emphasis on this, what, what I've told you at the beginning. Um, comments and open peer review is accepted. Um, what next? Please uh, take a look at the points. Um, more social media integration. Um, I think our main point to what open science is more community participation. We are now very a closed shop for economic uh, uh, economi economists, and uh, we have many followers in the social media platforms who usually don't comment or, or usually don't ask any questions uh, for the art and concerning the articles. Um, from a technical view, um, this, this is more for me important. As a developer, we need to adapt to more um, mobile usage. Um, the logs clearly show that is not the number of, of tablets and mobile phones and mobile browsers is steadily increasing. Our recent, our recent website and our actual website uh, does not pretty much uh, pretty good. Uh, Uh, adapt to this, and I think we need to think about more mobile friendlessly. This also means, uh, last point in this, uh, on this slide, that we need to get rid of the PDF. That's a dream, my personal dream. <laughs> uh, main lessons learned. Um, it is possible to establish an open access journal that is broadly accepted. I think that can be said without any uh, doubt. Uh, it is also pos possible to publish such a journal without any commercial publisher, Elsevier, to name the most uh, infamous. Open peer review works and is accepted, though perhaps this might be a discussion point, still only as a complement for traditional peer reviewing. And uh, last but not least, conservative uh, communities as I think the economic community is, economist, economist community, um, are slowly, slow, are very slow in moving towards Twines 2.0, uh, but they are moving and they are moving constantly. The willingness to adapt openness, collaboration over the web and new ways of scientific publishing and communication is uh, increasing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Bunker. Any questions here? Yes, please. Uh, microphone will come. I have a, a few questions concerning the open assessment exercise. Uh, do you systematically assess the assess and evaluate uh, the comments you get via the open peer review system? Are the reviews anonymous, or might the author also get into contact with one of the commenters, which might also open up a fruitful discourse. And last question, um, how do you know what happens between the official reviewers and the open assessment reviewers? 
do you ask reviewers whether they took uh, comments from the open assessment into account or do they say it? How do you know that uh, comments in the open assessment exercise are taken into account by the official reviewers? Um, the, the editors are not forced in, in any ways to, to uh, consider uh, the uh, comments by the readers. Um, the experience uh, so far is that they are usually doing it if there are substantial comments or substantial points in, in, in the comments. Um, the first but the article is not deleted. No, <laughs> no article is deleted. We have we have this uh, very for for economic very special very special uh, publishing uh, articles are first published as discussion papers so so called discussion papers. Um, this is an old tradition in economics, and um, this is the first hurdle an article has to take, and then the usual peer reviewing process starts with with editors and referees and so on, and they decide. Uh, if an article is published as journal article, if it is not published, uh, the, the article, the discussion, the discussion paper stays on a website. So it, it, it is published in this case. Um, the first question was, I think, um, if comments somehow are um, assessed by, by, by the office? Um, co comments are seen and, and evaluated. Uh, I think, Silvia, are you, have you any, any sometime deleted in comment? Once or twice. Huh? Once, or twice. <laughs> Once or twice, okay. So usually comments are, are substantial and uh, to the point, and uh, the fact that we have registered readers uh, allows us to, to see exactly who has posted this. Also, we as a, as system administrators and editorial office, um, of course, can see if someone writes nonsense or, or, or spam, I don't know, uh, which usually doesn't happen, of course, uh, then, then we would take action. And the third question was, I forgot already. Oh, that's, that's okay. Um, <laughs> not okay to forget it. <laughs> Again, please, yeah. Please. Second question answered? Uh, you want my second question? Yeah. Uh, my second question was, uh, how do you know that reviewers, and, and how, that reviewers take into account what uh, the open assessment uh, commentators say? You know? I said you can't force them, but do you know whether they do? Difficult question. Uh, I think uh, the referees or the co-editors editors are are not censored in any way. That's, that's more in commitment than enforcement. Okay. Well, one question from my side. Who's paying for that? What business model do you have? Business model? Uh, it's a contract. It's an official contract between uh, our library and the institute. So, so we, are, we are doing the infra all the technical infrastructure, programming, hosting, uh, library infrastructure as uh, storing at an econ store, registering the metadata at Redpack and so on. Yeah. And uh, the institute is doing all the editorial work and scientific work, um, uh, pre-choosing of submitted papers and something like that. Mm -hmm. So no author pay charges, nothing? No, nothing. No author pays any fees. No. It's like a paradise. It's paradise, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Economic paradise, yes. yeah. Ricarda Böttcher, a hand surgery specialist, was invited to write a textbook, but she disagreed on the publishing conditions, so she asked us informally if we could imagine to publish the book online, and yes, we could. A living textbook, it's like an online textbook in which articles can be published or updated any time. It's living. The project combines systematic manuals and textbooks with non-textual materials like images, films, and research data. There are no restrictions as in the print world. The articles are displayed as hypertext, and you can click on hyperlinks. Well, the idea is, in general is to publish, update, and expand the material in a collaborative and dynamic way. Um, science 
belongs to scientists means that an alternative publication platform is independent from the interest of commercial publishers and the authors stay with their rights. You can see here that we are working with Creative Commons licenses. Um, worldwide circulation uh, means that there is independent from paid subscriptions and means the acceleration of knowledge transfer because a rapid publication process and the public discussion of the published papers. This means facilitation of traceability and access and improvement of perception. Each article receives a DOI and this implies continuous citability and, that we, may, and we will make sure the preservation of the, of the books. The authors are all known personal and they are all scientists and all the accepted articles have successfully passed through peer review. For this pilot project, the target group are hand surgeons from all over the world, medical students and, well, even patients if they wish to be informed about the surgery they are about to undergo. But other books that we have planned will have other target groups and, generally speaking, the target group are scientists. The current status of the project is that we have programmed um, the first step from the publishing software. The first version is finished and now we are in the testing phase. So I can't, um, I can't show you all the sites, but lots of organizations have shown interest in the project and we have been asked to publish new books in the different fields of the life sciences. Our partners in this project are the Association of the Scientific Medical Societies in Germany and its 168 learned societies with about 200,000 members, the German Society for Surgery of the Hand and the International Federation of the Societies of Surgery of the Hand. Obviously, with new project, we will have other partners. We will expand the project in a more didactic direction and, well, first we will publish the open access peer-reviewed articles or if the new partners want, we will submit them to an open peer review process. Then academics will also have the possibility to publish the didactic materials and the next step will be to create a platform and a forum in which the community will be able to interact. The last step then will be a real e-learning platform which combines the scientific articles with the didactic materials and the possibility to test the results of the students. Well, we are starting right now, but um, we can say that it was very good to see how people from all over the world are getting interested in this kind of publication form, and I'm very curious now to see in what way we can develop this project and adapt it to the new Open Access and Science 2.0 requirements. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so this project was made up, driven by the demands of the users, knowing that our library is somewhat active in the field of open access, uh, 10 years now, with our German medical science, and now living textbooks are coming up. Yeah, any questions on this project? No? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, will the software be reusable? Will it be open source? Yes, um, we are working with Drupal, a content management system, and we have um, given it to a software company to make the templates, but we have had a lot of problems to make them understand what is a publishing um, template and what we want. But um, now we think they have understood and we can start and we will use this project for other books in the life sciences but obviously we will put it in the four years something to the community when we are sure that it's a very good project. And this is not only text but we have embedded videos also. Yes, yes. Yeah, because surgeons need that. Other questions? Yes, please. Ah, who's paying for this? Who's paying for that? Oh, this is a question you can... <laughs> this is a question to me, yeah? 
Well, in fact, uh, looking back at uh, German medical science, the portal with our now 17 journals and uh, about 30 congress reports per year, in this case, we, at the beginning, we had uh, publishing for free. Now we have a cost coverage of, of about 30%. Uh, taking some author charges, also some congress, congress charges for Congress articles. So in this case, we start with zero, and then after that, we have to make up a business model again, and then uh, they will have to pay a little bit for that. But I think it's also uh, a political issue there. I think that our library is part of the information infrastructure in Germany, and that uh, the country, Germany, has to pay for that also. So the taxpayers, you all, pay a little bit uh, of this project here. Um, well, it's, it's not free, but uh, it's free for the public. Well, in this page you can see that, we, that you can put in the internet different videos, uh, films, um, and you can play them, and before operation in the other side of the world, you can see like other um, doctors um, would like make the surgery and you can copy it. As always, some drastic pictures in the medicine, yeah. <laughs> but the outcome is normally good. Well, uh, my question is, um, how can uh, the editor uh, motivate the authors to write their chapters and be up to date? How can they manage that? In this case, um, Ms. Böttcher is going around the world and, and speaking in conferences about this book. And with these pages that are ready, like this, you can see how it will function. And she uh, makes a promotion for this book, in this, uh, for the hand surgery. And there are a lot of authors and scientists and doctors who want to participate. So there must be a driving force, as always. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my other questions, no? My last question is, what's about the sustainability? That means, well, living textbook can mean that today a chapter is here, tomorrow there will be another one. Uh, what's about archiving? Yeah, uh, you can see here the DOI. Each chapter will have a DOI, and so you can find it um, every time. And we have different versions. Here you can click on the previous version of this chapter. And um, every time we will um, have an update, there will be a new version, and so you can go on and follow all the different versions of this book. Yeah, thank you. So I think without two months, we know uh, what we have as a living textbook, really. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ms. Ami. In my project spotlight, I'm going to present you a recent project which was planned and carried out by the Open Science Lab at the German National Library of Science and Technology at Hanover. And as you can see, we called it the Book Sprint Co-Science yeah, at, at CBIT 2014. So let's look at this uh, in more detail. The first question is how did this project idea arise? So the starting point um, for our project was another book project um, with the title Opening Science in which Lambert Heller, the, the head of the Open Science Lab, was involved as an author. Um, and since this anthology largely focuses on the theoretical underpinnings of open science and collaborative science, um, we felt that a rather practically oriented counterpart um, was missing, so the idea arose to, to produce a handbook to <clears throat> close this perceived gap. In order to um, put this idea to practice, we defined um, some project aims. For example, we said that we wanted to create uh, an open knowledge resource for young scholars interested in collaborative digital science. And this one too should be realized as a, as a living book, as a living document. Um, then we chose um, a working title, um, Co-Science, Gemeinsam forschen und publizieren mit dem Netz. So it's um, doing collaborative research and publishing with the web. 
if you translate it. So obviously it, it was um, for a German speaking um, target group meant. Um, and this title reflects this, this practical orientation we, we had in mind from the beginning. Then we stated that we wanted to invite experts in the field of, of open science and collaborative science, that we wanted to demonstrate that the web-based collaborative platform, which allows for some kind of quality assurance, can be used to compose and publish scientific literature. And we said that we wanted to explore the book sprint as a new method uh, of rapid knowledge production. So the question that's, uh, that's arising here, of course, is uh, what's a book sprint? So, shortly said, it's a method for writing books um, in a collaborative manner, which was devised and promoted by Adam Hyde. As a rule of thumb, there are five to 15 experts um, who write in two to five days a book on a collaborative platform under the guidance of a facilitator. And this method was successfully, uh, successfully used to compose open source software manuals, and now it has been transferred to, to other fields. So if you are interested in more information in this method, so <clears throat> please have a look at Adam Hyde's website. Um, part of the pre-event preparation consisted in choosing a collaborative web-based platform for, for this book sprint. And we decided um, to use a platform based on the MediaWiki software, which was then tailored to, uh, to our needs by our developer, Gabriel Birke. And um, as you can see, um, the platform's name is Handbuch I, uh, Handbuch IO or Handbook, if you translate it, Handbook uh, IO. And as I've been telling you, we have invited uh, author experts, some of which are affiliated to the four member institutions of the Leibniz Research Alliance 2.0. Um, you see listed on this on the slide. Now we come to, to the book sprint as such, um, which took place in two phases. Phase one started at the first week of March. Um, so um, 13 authors um, met at or on the premises of, of the TEB, the uh, library. Some of them knew each other, some of them had never met before, so this was rather exciting. Um, and the course of action resembled that of a bar camp in so far as at the beginning of the first day, authors and facilitators were collecting ideas um, concerning the exact uh, content and structuring of, of the book and visualizing the decisions, as you, you can see in this photograph. And in, I could add that in each instance, um, two or three um, book sprint participants decided in a spontaneous manner to write uh, together about a topic um, in their area of expertise. The book sprint then continued in the second week of March at CBIT 2014, where it was presented to the public. And as you can see in the photograph, we had um, workplaces where some of the authors continued expanding and amending um, their respective chapters or were reviewing others, chapters where we did some proofreading. Um, concerning the current status of, of this project, um, I'd like to point out that there are several outcomes so far. There's um, a first version of the handbook assembled in, in, uh, during the book sprint with 11 chapters, which are more or less ready for, for publication. 
and um, we published this um, handbook under C or we, we are going to publish this under a CC BY license and it's already available in this HTML format. Um, the printed version will be forthcoming this year, hopefully. Um, as you may see, or you can have a look yourself under Handbuch.io, um, topics treated include, for example, reference management in collaborative projects, use of free licenses, there's an introduction to scientific blogging, for example. A further outcome I want to mention is that, of course, we had the first test run of this new method, of this book sprint method. And last not least, uh, last not least we have this, this platform. So this leads us to the question of who the target groups of the service are. So essentially there are two target groups. Um, the collaborative platform, Handbuch IO, um, provides a reusable infrastructure for further collaborative book projects, and the handbook as such, um, as I said, is aimed at um, young scholars, at early research, um, early career researchers who are interested in um, integrating these methods and, and tools into their daily work. As the book sprint was of an experimental, experimental nature, it didn't run completely smoothly, of course, there are some lessons learned. I want to mention only two. So <clears throat> first we found that it's quite difficult to find a proper balance between predetermined requirements concerning content and structuring on the one hand and spontaneous agreements during the book sprint on the other. So we came to the conclusion that book sprint organizers should consider perhaps adopting the role of editors too that means they should take some decisions beforehand and not only recommendations as we did <clears throat> and maybe provide some kind of author's guide with details or maybe um, another possibility to be considered is to invite an experienced facilitator like Adam Hyde. And a second lesson learned was the insight that there is a certain kind of conflict between two opposed requirements an ideal platform for book sprint projects should have. On the one hand, um, a revision control is needed to maintain living documents on, on a platform. This requirement, I would say, is fully met by, by our platform. On the other hand, during the book sprint, as such, the authors need uh, to work on their chapters on this document simultaneously like in Etherpad, for example, and in this regard, um, our platform is still not completely satisfactory, so there's still work ahead. Um, and to conclude the presentation, I would like to say that um, taking as a whole, the book sprint was uh, successful, so we have these 11 uh, chapters which are ready for publication, especially um, considering the fact that most authors only had two days for writing their, their respecting chapters. And of course, many open questions, questions remain. For example, it's not clear what kind of genres of scientific literature can be produced um, using this book sprint method. And there's at least one scientific project I'd like to point out to you. It's called um, Book Sprints for ICT Research. It's funded by the European Commission. Uh, and this project investigates in a systematic manner um, these open questions regarding book sprints. So you can, could have a look yourself at this address which is listed at the bottom of the, of the slide. So this slide completes my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you. This is uh, Science 2.0 Living, huh? really living. Well, um, my question was, from zero to book in five days, does it really work? Um, yeah, in the, well, there are examples of, uh, a lot of examples of uh, successful book sprints. So where you have at the end of the book sprint a high quality, some kind of high quality material, a handbook or a, some kind of manual. Um, and well, I, I guess one shouldn't be too dogmatic about this. Mm -hmm. So I know at least of one project 
one handbook project, they have organized, I think, two or three book sprints in a row to complete this handbook. So this could be another possibility if one uh, uh, recognizes that, that the, the result is not satisfactory. So it, it, one shouldn't be too dogmatic about this and could continue with another book sprint, possibly. But there are examples of successful yeah. book sprints. Any questions? Please. I have, I have two questions. First question, uh, who initiates the book? Does a group of authors come to you and say, we would like to write a book together? Do they know each other before they come together to write a book? Or do you or some editor who always wanted to write a manual about a, a certain issue come to you and say, let's find a group of authors? Uh, that's the first question. Second question, who controls the content and the revisions of the book once it is published so that it becomes a living document. Do you have an editor who says, well, this is an addition or a revision which does not threaten the consistency of the book or we have to bring the 13 authors together again to make sure that editions are uh, accepted by all the 13 authors? Yeah. Yeah. Um, concerning the, the first question, um, well, in this case, we... Uh, had this idea that a handbook in this field was missing and we invited, or Lambert Heller uh, invited all these authors. But this is only one possibility. You could invite authors or maybe um, there is already a group of authors with a certain idea in mind and they would come and, and say, okay, we want to, to have a book sprint and want to, to publish and write a, a book on, on this platform. And you could even um, do it like uh, um, when preparing conferences, uh, call for proposals, and so uh, obtaining authors. And concerning the second question, which was um, the question for revision. Consistency when revisions come in or written. Consistency. Yeah. Um, I guess we are still um, in the process of clarification about, because this is also recent um, and um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe Lambert could, could say something about this point. I'm, I'm not um, really sure about this, um, but I know it's a point we, 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 had, we had in mind. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, then you had the, um, the term facilitator. How do you see facilitator versus editor-in-chief? Well, um, a facilitator should be someone who doesn't have to know nothing about um, um, content. the content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a person who's uh, used to, yeah, to, to facilitate like a moderator, a, an moderator, event. Yeah. yeah, moderator, you would say in, in German. Um, and to, who has gathered experience in, well... Um, bringing people together. Yeah, bringing people bringing together. Pe people to work. And to, yeah, to talk, to, <laughs> to collaborate and to, 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 to further the, the process of, of writing. And if there are some blockades, maybe mm. he can help. And, yeah. But then do you have no responsible person for the, for the contents of the book? Pardon? No, you have no responsible person for the contents of the complete book. Yeah, as, as I said, maybe um, the organizers should also be the, the editors, and um, in this case, they should have the over, or should um, yeah, keep in control of, of the content. Yeah. And that's, that's why I, I propose to, to invite a professional uh, facilitator for not um, doing all these kind of things. Mm. Um, um, together, so being editor, facilitator, and I don't yeah. know what else. Yeah. One question, yeah. yeah. I'll make it really short. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm, I just wonder, because what you just said about bringing people together and so forth, that is something an editor does. An editor also brings people together and has sort of a combination of subject matter uh, uh, expertise and and sort of is somebody who sort of cracks the whip when people don't deliver and, and so forth. I just wonder why it's sort of anathema 
to the to the book sprint idea to have an editor who's a person who says you have to deliver by a certain you know what I mean the, there seems to be a resistance to this idea that there's somebody taking charge maybe because that's sort of not democratic enough or something and on the other hand my experience is when when nobody when there is nobody who's taking charge things well don't always go the way they should is that is that true or is the facilitator the person who actually does that or well uh, it's it's i don't um, i i think not not everybody is, is capable to 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 facilitate in a book sprint because this is a quite complex task and if you are not used to do this you may be a splendid editor but this doesn't mean that you are a splendid uh, facilitator too so yeah 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 this is a project we are very excited about uh, at the Saxon State and University Library, or short SLUP, uh, as I will refer to. Uh, for, for several reasons, uh, we uh, didn't show much hesitation when we saw the opportunity to join the Science 2.0 uh, Research Alliance because that's something that's very important for us. And, and so we are in the process of developing uh, services and, and uh, infrastructure to su really support that and the data management platform um, is one of them uh, and I hope uh, to to show why this is so. So just a few key facts that will help you contextualize uh, this project. Uh, you, you often asked uh, who is paying for it, well in this case it's the uh, European Regional Development Fund uh, to the volume of one and a half million uh, euro uh, for a year and a half, uh, started in June last year will conclude uh, September this year. Currently we are uh, in the, well, in several cycles of agile development uh, and hopefully by the middle of April we will be testing and, and I hope uh, some of you uh, uh, see that as an opportunity to contribute to this project. Uh, there are four partners. Uh, apart from uh, the Saxon State and the University Library, we also have the University Library in Leipzig. Um, Amangot Labs, which is a very exciting, innovative um, firm, in, a knowledge architecture firm in Dresden, uh, with whom we have been working in the past, and uh, we have greatly profited from uh, working from them, especially in semantically enriching uh, data, and I will be saying more on that, uh, no doubt. And last but not least, uh, the Agile Knowledge Engineering and Semantic Web uh, Research Group, at the University of Leipzig, concretely at Leipzig Institute for Applied Informatics. Um, there are two components. Uh, I will talk mostly about the first one, which is the data management platform. Uh, but of course, there's also the electronic resource management, which is the first uh, implementation, if you like, of the data management uh, platform. So I hear you asking, what is a data management platform? It's a very generic name, but put very simply, uh, it is simply a tool for the large-scale integration of data from heterogeneous sources. That is, uh, all kinds of data, structures, unstructured, if you believe in such a thing, uh, with metadata of all sorts, uh, without. Uh, this is supposed to be a tool that helps you integrate them. Um, at the heart of this tool, uh, there is a data modeling tool, which helps you map between different uh, sets of metadata, for example. Uh, with a graphical and easy-to-use interface that leads to a flexible, elastic, graph-based data model at the back. Um, and so th this is the, the core of the data management uh, platform as far as integration and modeling goes. Uh, architectonically, uh, it's a middleware solution, so it's a piece of software that isn't a system. It sits between layers uh, of existing uh, system, for example, existing data management system, on the back end and presentation front ends of all kinds uh, on the front end. So, of course, we hope uh, that not only we will be using this uh, software, but others too, so it's an open source uh, platform. Uh, concretely, we, of course, will, uh, or are in intending to use it um, to increase the quality of library data uh, at, at the slope, uh, for example, by identifying duplicate data sets uh, merging the data, ferberizing, so identifying uh, at which level of functional requirement uh, the data is, enriching uh, the data uh, semantically, and last but not least, also uh, publish it as uh, linked open data with, uh, for example, RDF uh, um, metadata. The resource management system uh, is a first implementation on top of the data management uh, platform. 
which uh, seeks to uh, offer an application, a web application concretely for the management of library data. So it will use the data that has been merged in the data, uh, in the data management platform and will allow uh, libraries to manage all the issues that have to do with, uh, I don't know, uh, um, um, copyrights, uh, access, uh, and, and so forth, uh, you know, this kind of things. Good. Uh, why did we choose to undertake such an ambitious project? I, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, I don't think I need to legitimize, but let, let me show you our thinking behind this project, uh, and hopefully you will uh, recognize some similar thoughts in, in your institution. Um, while we were working on enrichment and enriching, semantically enriching uh, metadata uh, of our holdings at the library, we, we realized that we depend on very expensive at times, yet insufficient tools for labor, library data management and library automation. Concretely, uh, the software was, generally speaking, proprietary, commercial, and with very narrow limits regarding flexibility and scope. That is, they do some things very well, but the moment you, you want to go, uh, you know, in a different direction, it's a bit of a nightmare. Let's not talk about exporting data and merging and so on and so forth. So as a consequence, um, you have the, the typical problems we, that have been mentioned here in, in the conference the last uh, today and, and yesterday. Uh, that is that concretely data remains locked into data silos. Uh, and it's really prevented from the free and open use at the core of the emerging research paradigm, Science 2.0. Um, and that led us to the thought, well, we definitely need a solution for flexible and highly scalable data management because data that is free and openly available data is at the core of Science 2.0. So let me show you, we, we, as I said, we are in, in the middle of uh, development still, so there's nothing uh, concrete yet to show. But let me show you how, uh, with, with the help of this illustration, how our thinking uh, progressed. So this, this is a situation that we had prior to uh, the project. Uh, basically, we had a, a number of uh, back-end systems that, um, as I said, were very good in some sense and very narrow uh, applications, but were uh, very difficult in terms of integrating. In this case, just integrating it for a discovery system uh, with a front end in our, in our uh, website. Uh, so this is where the data management system platform sorry, really came in. In, on top of that, it wasn't our, only our aim to integrate all the back-end system, but also to link up our data uh, with all the information that is outside. We, we are under no uh, illusion that the information that we hold uniquely or uh, you know, uh, as a special uh, uh, holding is the only data researchers need. Researchers need that, yes, of course, uh, but they also need... Uh, an increasing number of data which is out there in the web, uh, sometimes, uh, if we're lucky, as uh, linked open data. So this is exactly what uh, the data management platform does. Is it puts, pulls together these streams of data. Uh, it allows you on the back end to graphically link them, um, and it puts them out either on the discovery system that we already have, uh, out into the web as linked open data. But of course, once this is possible, it can be exported to all sorts of interfaces uh, on the front. Um, so th this is our intention. Here's just an example. Uh, this is about, what, a half a year old, the graphical user interface that allows um, really, really librarians to map different data sets. In this case, uh, it's a bit small, but maybe you, you get the idea. You have two uh, schema, schemata that uh, describe uh, data sets, and this graphical uh, interface, user interface, allows you to uh, identify, in this case, very easy because the, both sets are uh, doubling core, and they say, well, this DC uh, colon subject is the same as this DC colon subject. Uh, and so what you get at, uh, on the end here is a workflow that merges the data. Uh, it uh, sifts out duplicate uh, data and it puts it into a, a format that can be reused later on as linked open data or on any of, of the interfaces that I have identified. Um, Jens Mittelbach, uh, the project leader of uh, the data management platform, 
uh, couldn't be here. He would be the one who would have explained this, I'm sure, much better than me. Uh, but please do contact him if you have questions uh, and visit the website, dmpslab dresdende if you want in English, uh, forward slash uh, en. There's a very, very nice uh, presentation there. If, if I didn't make any sense, please check it out. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think it made a lot of sense what you said. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, coming back again from periodicals, from living textbooks, uh, from textbooks written within days to data. Is this what you have a virtual library? What data do you, do you combine? Data inside from the library or even outside? All, all kinds of data. Uh -huh. that, that, that's the, at the core of, of this idea. I, I, I don't think these uh, borderlines between data inside outside mm -hmm. uh, is a very useful one, certainly not for the, for the researcher. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we, we do have heterogeneous data within our walls, if, you know, in terms of uh, actual descriptive data, catalog entries, but also uh, e publications and so on. Yeah. Uh, increasingly, but very slowly, also uh, research data sets, and uh, of course this needs to be linked also to data outside of the library, and, and so this is what it does, the integration. Yeah. Any questions? Hmm? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, my, my question is just a brief one. Uh, how does the typical uh, user of, of the new platform look like? Do you have a, a certain idea who this person is? Well, to start with, it will be a librarian. Uh, so so this, this is just the, the, the concrete focus for this uh, cycle of the project. Uh, so what we'd like to do is sort out our own data, and uh, I, I guess the same will happen at the University Library in, in Leipzig. But the problems and the solutions to the problems are of such a nature that they're very generic. And so we think it would be useful to any kind of um, cultural heritage professional uh, but in the end, every user, because uh, every researcher who is in need of data integration will be able to use uh, this as part of a stack of software that might uh, solve the, these problems. So, in short, yes, the librarian, uh, but hopefully later on, uh, pretty much everyone who needs to work with uh, data. Yeah. Other questions? Well, um do you think that uh, this combining of data, even in semantic kind, can lead to an information overflow? Um, well, we, we already have an information overflow, if you <laughs> like. Uh, so, uh, in a way, we, we will help uh, with two things uh, by getting rid of duplicates where, mm. where they're clearly identified as duplicates, uh, and also by enriching it so it helps you disambiguate mm. uh, and. and uh, you know, navigate your way through the, through the data. Uh, you know, do, do, when you type in bank, do you know, do you mean the institution or do you, need, do you mean the, the uh, area next to a river, for example? Yeah. And we have different information for each of those. We, we don't just give it all together. Yeah. We cannot dis disambiguate. Well, I would like to warn you a little bit. We have some experience of catalog enrichment, okay. scanning the contents of books, of book uh, content pages, and then putting in the title of chapters and of authors. And, uh, well putting it in our virtual medical library, MedPilot, and then the result was someone looking for a specific term, let's say liver rupture, he finds textbook of surgery, because within the textbook there's a minor chapter about that, and he's not amused. Right. So uh, this, is, this is information overflow by enrichment. So a little bit of warning there. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Six to eight minutes, that's the promise. Um, this is the title. I work in a medical library in a university medical center in Groningen, the north uh, of the Netherlands. Um, 3,700 3, researchers, authors, publish uh, 2,500 art articles per year. And uh, I work in the medical library supporting and facilitating uh, patient care, research, and education. My role as um, a coordinator, electronic services is to make sure that these students can, can work and study in our library, but also to make sure that the people who don't come to our library 
the scientists, the clinicians, the, the staff of the university uh, get the best resources um, uh, wherever they want it and whenever they need it. Uh, this is me, if you want to find something about what I'm doing, um, about me slash DigiCMB or uh, rebelmouse.com slash DigiCMB. Why am I telling you this? Because in my work as a coordinator for electronic services, I also have the part of innovation. And it's my, my focus to find out um, what, I, what we can do as a librarian to um, facilitate researchers um, on their topics, but mostly on their workflow. From their, from, uh, yeah, it's very grassroots. Uh, we try to go do this from bottom up. And the things that I do to keep up with what's going on in Science 2.0 is that I try to monitor and I try to curate because that I, th I think that's a job librarians uh, uh, should do. And I share. I want to share it. So therefore, we organized this workshop on uh, Science 2.0. And because I have that knowledge, I can also do uh, presentations uh, outside the library about research library support services or publish about it, yes, please, publish about it in a, in a kind of a journal um, by Scoopit, which is a curation tool which allows me to select and to aggregate information I want to know and share it very easily in a public journal uh, created like that. And also, I do that about, uh, this is about research services, this is about any, any metrics or alt metrics, bibliometrics, whatever, I find and find it interesting to share, I use this tool. Um, so also, one of the latest and most powerful tools I found to, to advise people to use, to start using, is uh, this rebelmouse.com, uh, which is a curation and aggregation tool, which gives you the power to, uh, to show to users that they can have information um, from all over the place into one focused uh, website. So this particularly um, scientist who's working at the University Medical Center Groningen, I advised to use this tool, Rebel Mouse, to make it possible to show all his social media that was out there, to show it for his users in one place. So he is, he's blogging at PLOS, he is doing things on Facebook, he has his own blog, he's doing Twitter, but he didn't have an overview of what he is doing at all. So Rebel Mouse allows him to do that, and I helped him with that as a, as a role from the librarian. So, um, also, this is one example of how I help the hospital to see what's going on about the hospital in social media. Again, Rebel Mouse aggregates and cur curates, it gives you a very powerful tool to show um, information about your organization online. We also try to promote scientific output. I created a simple blog. Um, showing every single article by hospital staff uh, as a blog post, which creates um, results in Google searches and eventually, hopefully, more citations. So, and, and also, in a much bigger scheme, we are also working on a, a new CRIS system on Pure in the university, together with University Library, um, to even show the scientific output of the university and the university hospital in total. This is going to be launched in June this year. So in that perspective, I started this workshop, Science 2.0, because I, I know people might benefit from that. And it's very bottom-up. I mean, I started the grass seed. Uh, I do the workshop in the library. People can come. It's free. Um, so we're taking outside stuff inside the organization and see uh, what, what can, can be learned from that. One thing that we learn is no one size fits all. There might be cool tools out there for Science 2.0, but not every scientist wants to use them. It, for, for a librarian, it's good to find out who needs what and in what's, what way. So these are the topics I think they they are pretty normal topics to discover, discuss in a Science 2.0 discussion. Um, anything. My focus is on the workflow. If I get a chance to um, discuss with a scientist in a workshop about his work and I can make it more easier 
for one task in his workflow, for instance, how to keep up to date with his scientific journals, reading. I'm happy for that day. Um, and this is how it looks uh, sometimes as a permanent beta version of a very old-fashioned uh, screen where I paint stuff, we discuss, we show things, we work on, uh, on, on tools, and in the end it might look like this. Um, so what's next? Well, the, the, the success of the workshop, we, we get more and more known. It's not, that, uh, not, not completely full all the time, um, but it's, it's hard work creating awareness. And I think librarians should do that. Uh, Mr. Nicholas said yesterday that in his research, uh, librarians were not mentioned. Uh, but I think they, sh they should play a role in, um, in making scientists aware what is possible out there and m help them uh, in any way they can. So the, the workshop is about exchanging and interaction, pro improving um, workflow, tailor-made, yes, as long as you can, you do it one-on-one. -on -one. It changes the perception of the library because they suddenly feel, okay, I can go to the library for something else than just books and articles. That's very good. And also on the library staff, by sharing it with my colleagues, they, they see really how it works for scientists that, that go away happy from the uh, workshop. Um, that improves uh, their awareness too. So my motto is, and it's, it's not my real motto, it's from Locke and Dempsey, also mentioned yesterday, if you want to be seen as an expert, uh, make sure that your expertise is seen out there. The inside out library. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ruiz. So it's not one size fits all, isn't it? It's going Ab individually. Absolutely not, no. I leave the tools that have to work for most of the people to the university library itself. In the, the medical library, we can do more um, um, stuff on, on a lower scale, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you say what are the, the main demands of the scientists? Is there a main demand or are they individuals? It is, um, it, it's individuals, um, and we'd like to also teach the PhD students because they are starting with research, but. Um, like, what, like I said, if you can help a scientist with uh, one part of his workflow, which might, might be researching or keeping up to date or um, sharing stuff or, or making an, a bigger impact on his uh, web presence, advising about profiles. We see that a lot of people are doing these things, finding, making profiles in ResearchGate or on Google Scholar. And then the organization is thinking about, should we create another website to make profiles? I mean, we are trying to adapt there. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to advise people. Yeah. Any question? Oh, last row. It's very impressive. Uh, do you have some feedback from the scientists? Are you on the way to the embedded librarian? Sorry, the last word I didn't understand. Are you, uh, are you on the road uh, to the embedded librarian? Um, yes, we, we get uh, positive feedback, but then that's most of the time because it's, we're very close by. I mean, when we're in one room, maximum 15 persons, um, so you get a lot of feedback. I usually start with making a quick round what their expectations are, and as I finish at the end if it was worth it. And most of the time I have a few appointments to go after that, to help somebody out there. What is Science 2.0 for you as a practitioner? Please, please start. I think you were the last one. What is Science 2.0 for you? Well, uh, I think I, I can summarize with what I said uh, just before. If I think Science 2.0, I think about improving um, um, one or more parts of the workflow of the scientists doesn't matter about what, what tools, it's more openness and, um, and, and more efficient. Yeah, this is Arning. Well, to be short is um, to help scientists to publish the works in the world, all over the world. In open access manner. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, Umberto Eco once said, uh, one of the rules of the librarian is the student is your enemy. Um, I, I, th I think it's, it's exactly the opposite, and I, I thought that was a great example, the last one, how, how you, you develop uh, together with the user new services that really help, and, and that can only be done in interaction, very close interaction. Mr. Mr. Mayerberg. Yeah, I would say it's a label we put on this increased visibility of research processes, including um, communication processes in general. Mr. Bunke. Um, I'd like to recall a picture or Schöpfling gave yesterday, heading to new shores on uh, very traditional ways. Um, I think that's what we are doing right now. We, are, we have not reached the new paradise shores uh, with open science uh, possibilities, but we are still, especially we, which was uh, very clearly rooted in a traditional publishing system, e-journal, um, but we try to build the, the bridges, and I think that's, that's uh, f especially for me as a developer, uh, building bridges together with users, together with uh, librarians, um, that's, that's the picture I see what I'm doing. Yeah. Any comments from people sitting down there? <laughs> okay. Then the next question from my side, well, we are all librarians, or working in a library, working in a library, not all, all librarians. Um, how do you feel to, like coming closer into contact with the users? What's the feeling and what do you get back from them? Especially who's, who have this close contact. How do you feel about that? Um, uh, it's very rewarding. Uh, and I, that's not my uh, goal. I don't want to be rewarded, but uh, it's very rewarding when you, um, when you actually realize you're making a life uh, of a, a researcher a little bit uh, easier uh, by advising him to use tools for uh, publishing or for uh, uh, sharing or curating. Does he always accept your advices? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I, I think um, we, uh, I said one tool doesn't fit all, so you, you shouldn't uh, tell them what to do. You should offer them Choices. Offer choices. Offer choices, yeah. This is Arnie. You have closer contact, especially in the field of open access publishing, with societies or with editors. How's about that? Um, yes, with the um, older partners, it's a wonderful work. They are very grateful for our work. But um, it's hard sometimes to convince other people, other scientists to publish. But uh, it's a uh, good work, and I think we are making the right steps in this direction. Yeah, and it's hard to find peer reviewers sometimes, yes? Yes, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mr. Milberg? Um, What's about feeling contact to users? Well, I can... Um, um, I recall a man uh, or a visitor at, at a CBIT booth um, who said concerning our, our, this book sprint method or this book sprint in general. Well, that's very interesting, but that's not my cup of tea. I'm, I'm too old for this. <laughs> um, but but um, I let it to, to, to the younger people. Um, so he was interested, but, well, it wasn't his, his upbringing. So he said, I, I couldn't sit in a room with 10 people and write my, my article. So maybe um, this one is, this book sprint is some format for, for younger researchers, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But one shouldn't generalize. Yeah, one shouldn't generalize, no. Yeah? Any other comments? Well, um, do you hear me? I, uh, I, do, I do enjoy, um, my nature is that I really enjoy talking to people and interacting and so on. Um, and, and I'm very lucky to, to work with a team that is, is very uh, engaged. Uh, but one thing, one thing that I found, and I can only talk for myself, is um, the realization how little I know about the user. Uh, on top of, of course, they want to use our rooms and they want to use our data, if you like. Um, and so th th there's, there's a real need to do more, um, more in terms of assessing what, what is needed. And, and uh, a lot of uh, what, what we developed in terms of services uh, is based more on anecdotal, anecdotal you know, experience and so on. And I think, oh, they, well, we did this once and it was really cool. Uh, instead of saying, well, what we need is a, is a better picture of what the needs are uh, and therefore use our resources, which are quite tight, 
uh, in, a, in a better way and target really the, the basic needs of, of the users, of different kinds of users, you know, from students to, to cutting edge uh, scholar, uh, and maybe developing some key areas where we, we can also fill some, some holes in, in, in the economy of services in the, in the university or in the research campus. Yes, and the needs of the users are changing every year. That too. <laughs> yeah. One experience from my side, I had a contact to a user professor in Regensburg, and uh, he told me I do, I do not need your library anymore. I said, well, no document supply, you need articles. No, he said, I just send an email to the author and get it done by, by, via PDF. And I said, Copy, copyright? Oh, no problem for me. But I said, uh, well, what do you need, what do you really need from a library? He said, just care about three things. First, care about my publications. Open access, please. Second thing, care about my research data. Open access, please. And the third thing, please care about my software. Open source. Well, these are the needs of that um, researcher. After that, he told me I have, I have one additional need. This is in the morning I get, uh, when switching on my PC, I get a lot of information, tweets and... Uh, citations of other people to my work, and I need a software to filter that, to save time. And uh, I found nobody constructing such a software, and then we care for that, and now we have a little piece of software, and he's quite happy. Yes, and uh, I see I have only one minute left. Well, uh, yes, please. a question, uh, perhaps a bit provocative. Um, what about the users uh, defining their needs? Uh, well, I want to publish in a well-known and with a possible high-impact factor journal because I'm on a tenure track. I, I want to be a professor, and uh, I don't care about open access. I don't care about open science. I just want to get uh, my tenure track. Um, I think that's, that's not the minority. Uh, perhaps question the, to the audience. Uh, for, for us, as an open access journal, this, this has been a problem. Problem. It's still a problem, and I think uh, all the discussion about open science has uh, to have in mind uh, the scientist still standing on the other side of the shore to stay in the picture. Well, I think we would have to care for this user also, helping him to publish in, an, in, an, in a commercial journal, yeah? publication-wise. I mean, we, we, uh, there's a colleague from Jülich here from the, who does also bibliometrical Work, but I think I think that's becoming increasingly part of of the portfolio of services that that we are giving, and and yes, if 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 a user, I mean the user is king, right, mm. uh, in that or queen, depending, um, and and if the user wants to publish uh, in a non-open source, well, I mean I can try to convince, but my job is really to make his work or her work better uh, as a researcher. But, but shouldn't we educate users? It's, it's, a, it's, it's just a question. I don't, I don't know, really. Definitely. Yeah. There, there, are, there are still many organizations that are um, evaluating researchers by output and impact. Uh, that should change, then. They should take more and more um, into consideration altmetrics and, and not the hard citation uh, data. Uh, if they only get paid, if they publish in the top 25%, and um, not specifically open access, that's conflicting. Well, we have to close the discussion, um, and I'm going to close with a cite from Mr. van den Breekel, which I found very good. He says, if you are able to change or suggest one improvement or alternative solution for one workflow issue, even partially, making it more efficient, saving time and effort, you will make the researcher happy. The researcher happy and the library happy. So Science 2.0 is a way to improve the way we research, we collaborate, and we publish.